another edition of Best Horror Movie You Never Saw, where we talk about examining films that have flown under the radar or gained traction throughout the years, earning them a place as a cult classic or underrated gem that was either before its time or has aged like a fine wine. In this episode, we're going to be discussing 1989 high seas thriller, Dead Calm. Directed by Philip Noyce, produced by Mad Max franchise mastermind George Miller, and scripted by Miller's The Road Warrior and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome co-writer Terry Hayes, Dead Calm is based on a novel by Charles Williams and stars Sam Neill and Nicole Kidman as John and Ray Ingram, a couple who have gone out to sea on their yacht while dealing with the grief of losing their young son in a car accident. After a month at sea, they cross paths with a young man named Huey Warriner, played by Billy Zane, as he flees from a sinking schooner. There were six of us. Yeah, this died 10 days ago. Huggy tells them that everyone else on the schooner died of botulism 10 days earlier after eating some bad canned salmon, but John, who's served in the Navy and has 25 years of experience at sea, has trouble buying his story. You don't like him, do you? I haven't really thought about it. John. Once Huey falls asleep, John heads over to the schooner and finds that he was right to doubt the stranger, because the other people on board have been murdered and cut to pieces. <laughs> Unfortunately, this means he has just left his wife on their yacht with a killer. Before John can get back to the yacht, Huey has taken control of it and taken Ray captive. Stuck on the water-filled schooner, John tries to keep it from sinking so he can use it to catch up with the yacht, while Ray does whatever it takes to make sure she and her husband will both make it through this alive. Along for the ride is a smart little dog named Ben, but animal lovers should be warned, every fun or clever thing you see Ben do early on is only going to lead to trouble later. Williams' novel is actually a sequel to his 1960 book, A Ground, which served as the basis for the 1965 French film, The Dictator's Guns. In that one, John and Ray meet when she hires him to locate a schooner that was stolen by gunrunners. This was the second adaptation of Dead Calm to go into production, following a disastrous attempt made by Orson Welles soon after the novel was published. Welles had hoped to turn the story into a thrilling crowd pleaser, but even after a couple years of off and on again filming, he didn't manage to get all the footage he needed, and the death of star Lawrence Harvey ensured the project would never be completed. Miller's production company acquired the film right from Wells' estate just months after he passed away in 1985. Noyce, Miller, and Hayes managed to successfully complete their adaptation, but it wasn't an easy process. Principal photography took place on the water between the Great Barrier Reef and mainland Australia, with interior scenes being shot on sets that are on top of flotation devices in a large water tank, and filming at sea proved to be so complicated that production stretched on for 14 weeks. An indie made on a budget around $6 million, Dead Calm secured distribution from Warner Brothers, but the studio did require a new ending to be filmed, almost a year after filming had wrapped, before they would release it. Even with the more exciting climax, the movie only did modest business at the global box office, earning just under $8 million in the States. It wasn't a failure, but it didn't have much of an impact, aside from the fact that Tom Cruise watched it and got Kid and Cass in Days of Thunder, starting a career in the Hollywood mainstream. Noyce moved on to Hollywood himself, but was hired to direct films like Blind Fury and Patriot Games based on the merits of things he had done before Dead Calm. It wasn't seen by a large audience, but the film was well received by critics. The New York Times had even counted it among the top 1,000 movies ever made. It quickly gathered a cult following and remains a cult favorite to this day, even while the creative team seems to have let it fade into the past. It's rare to see anyone involved talk about the film in depth, and the DVD and Blu-ray releases have been bare bones. This really deserves to get a special edition that's packed with bonus features, but it doesn't look like one is forthcoming. Dead Calm is an incredibly well-crafted thriller that establishes a deeply unnerving tone right away. Thanks to Hayes' decision to ditch the honeymoon aspect of the source material and replace it with a tragic backstory for John and Ray. The film begins with a sequence that shows exactly how the couple's son died, and Noyce doesn't pull any punches while doing so, even including a shot in which the toddler's body is launched through the windshield of Ray's car. <laughs> The sequence plays out with very little dialogue, and the dialogue that is there just makes it even more troubling, as John is told that his little boy took 20 minutes to die. Sir, he was unconscious, Captain. He wouldn't have been aware of any pain. How long, Doctor? Uh, 20 minutes. 
After opening with that gut punch, we move on to the location where the entire rest of the story will play out, the open sea, with no hint of land in any direction. This setting allowed cinematographer Dean Semler to capture some stunning imagery. But while the vast ocean is nice to look at, when things go wrong, this sight also brings a feeling of terrifying hopelessness to the film, driving home the fact that John and Ray will have to make it through this ordeal on their own. They're alone in this. Noise and haze don't make us wait long for the thrills. John and Ray have taken Huey into their yacht within the first 15 minutes, and the the conflict between them carries on with the rest of the 96 minute running time. They did an impressive job of keeping the situation tense that entire time, repeatedly giving John and Ray hope that they'll be able to get out of this quickly, then throwing more obstacles in their way. It's a very emotionally and intellectually engaging scenario, making the viewer ponder how they would handle things if they were in Ray or John's position. Neil, Kidman, and Zane are the only cast members for the majority of the film, and each of them did a great job bringing their character to life. Neil's John comes off as being a very capable person. We root for him to figure out a way to catch up with Ray and Huey, and even when the odds are stacked against him, and they usually are, it seems like he's going to be able to pull through this with skill and determination. And yet, by the end, there has been a reversal. John is the one in serious distress, and Ray has to step up to rescue him. may seem like Kidman was miscast. He was only 19 when filming began and turned 20 during the lengthy production. Ray had originally been envisioned as being 36 years old, but Noyce, Hayes, and Miller had been so impressed by Kidman while working with her on a miniseries about the Vietnam War. I, I would say that it's very difficult for any of us who didn't go through what you and your friend experienced over there to, um, to understand. The character was rewritten specifically for her and changed into a 24 year old. For the filmmakers, Ray's personal journey was the primary focus of the story, and Noyce said, We felt the audience could identify more with a young woman. Because, in a kind of rite of passage, she goes from weakness to power, from girlhood to womanhood, from loss to regrowth. Ray goes through so much. The audience probably could have sided with a 36 year old version of the character just as well, but the casting of Kidman worked out for the film and especially for the actress herself. Ray's youth also brings brings an interesting edge to her interactions with Huey, who is closer to her age than her husband is, as Billy Zane is only one year older than Kidman. Huey is clearly attracted to Ray, and she uses that to her advantage, leading to an uncomfortable sex scene. Zane had appeared in Back to the Future and Critters before this, but Huey was his most prominent role yet, and what's really great about his performance is that he didn't choose to play the character as a completely unhinged lunatic. Huey tries to be friends with Ray, tries to show his side of things. The filmmakers drop Zane off on an island to spend a few days with the actors who appear as the other schooner passengers and home video footage, and during that time he was able to craft his own story for Huey in which he feels like he was the wronged one. The other passengers turned against him. He had to kill them, and now he's going to sell away to freedom. He was the hero of his own story, but he does some very bad things that we can't condone. So when we reach the reshot ending in which Huey is definitely taken out in a very flashy way, <laughs> too bad for him. Much like the ending of Fatal Attraction, this ending was added when test audiences reacted poorly to the more low-key, ambiguous ending the filmmakers originally wanted the film to have. It was a little obvious it was tacked on, but it works. One of the greatest scenes in the film comes when John realizes what Huey has done to the schooner, and that leaving Ray on the yacht with him was a bad idea. He jumps in a dinghy and tries to cover the distance between the two ships before Huey can take the yacht away. Watching a guy try to row a dinghy quickly may not sound like something that would be exciting, but the performances of the actors, the editing by Richard Frank Francis Bruce, and the music by Graham Revelle all work together to make this a standout sequence that effectively gets the pulse pounding. It ends with John trying to jump from the dinghy to the yacht, but he doesn't quite make it and falls into the water. <laughs> the filmmakers were able to complete Dead Calm and thus succeeded where the legendary Orson Welles had failed makes this movie a notable curiosity that's worth seeking out. Once you do, you're rewarded with a harrowing thriller that features some great acting and has a thick atmosphere of tension and dread hanging over every minute of it. The idea of watching a film that mainly follows just three characters as they sell the ocean may seem daunting to some viewers, but the filmmakers kept things moving at a good pace and never let too many minutes go by without something exciting or awful happening. Because of this, more than 30 years after it came and went at the box office, Dead Calm still holds up. So, if you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe, and if you have any suggestions for us, please leave them in the comments below.